Magnetism is one of the oldest studied phenomena on Earth. And these days our lives run on magnetism. You'd think we'd know more about it. An ampere is a unit of electricity, a liter is a unit of liquid, an inch is a unit of measurement, and a second is a unit of time. Can anybody give me a unit of magnetism? Uh, nope. Right. Well, there's Gauss, which my encyclopedia pronounces Gauss, and Orsteds, or Ursteds, Teslas, and Webers, named after a mathematician, a natural philosopher, an electrician inventor, and a physicist. Magnetism seems to touch all areas of scientific thought. Exactly what is a Gauss, Orsted, Tesla, and Weber escapes the Acme School of Stuff. In all of the reference work, the units are defined in terms of each other. Some things we do know. A magnet is a thing in which a high concentration of magnetic lines of force pass through its body due to the alignment of its constituent atomic dipoles. What this means is that you can consider a magnet to be made of zillions of tiny magnets, all aligned in the same direction. This theory is backed up by the fact that no matter how many little pieces you cut a magnet into, they'll all have a north and a south pole. When the tiny magnets are all arranged at random, the magnet is demagnetized. This is a clue to how information is left behind on your average magnetic material. The lines of magnetic force exist largely between the magnet's poles. In the case of this bar magnet, that's something like this. The lines of force form a closed circuit. Quantifying the strength of magnetic fields ought to be simple, but it isn't. A little rooting through a surplus store came up with this Gauss meter. Acme shops for all of its sophisticated precision measurement devices at the surplus store. Now this one came with no instructions, and we're not too sure what a darn Gauss is, but its operation was carefully checked against my Boy Scout compass, and it, it seems to be working all right. According to this meter, the Earth's magnetic field seems to be about one Gauss. The problems with measuring magnetic intensity are twofold. For one thing, I have to make the presumption that it's measured at the peak of those magnetic lines of force. For another, it follows the inverse square law. That means that its intensity falls away as the square of its distance. One way to get a picture of the inverse square law in your mind is to imagine spreading a fixed amount of peanut butter over an expanding sphere. A sphere's area varies proportionately with the square of its radius. That means that when the sphere is twice as big, there'll be four times less peanut butter at any one spot. Magnetism follows the same laws as peanut butter. So, how to use this to measure intensity? I decided to sort all of my magnets by measuring Gauss at the strongest part of the field. Magnetizing something seems to be a matter of aligning those constituent atomic dipoles. The effect seems to be instantaneous and depend on the strength of the applied field. Information is written to magnetic media using electromagnets something like this. They're called heads. The magnetic force is concentrated in the gap between the two poles. The intensity and polarity of the magnetism is proportional to the applied electric current. The passing material forms a closed magnetic circuit uh, in the gap with those lines of force, and it receives patterns of magnetism that correspond to the way the current was varying. The amount of magnetism left on a tape or disc depends on the characteristics of the medium. Now, I have a list from a manufacturer show, that shows the ability to be magnetized of various media. The units aren't mentioned, but I think they should be in Orsteds. But no matter what the units really are, the numbers will give you a relative feel. They go like this. Double density diskette, 300. Normal audio cassette, 365. High density diskette, 600 to 700. Videotape, 700. And chrome audio cassette, 1100. Now, this means that ordinary audio cassettes and computer discs are the most easily written of magnetic media. It also means they're the most easily rewritten of magnetic media. Just to see how easily a disc could be damaged, I set up a test. I made a disc with 10 short files on it. Now, between each of the short files, I copied a fairly long file. That was to ensure that my 10 short files were scattered all over the disc. A batch file called Go finds and displays all of those 10 short files when I type the name of it.
Ten copies of that disc were subjected to various magnetic tortures in the Acme lab. Now, even though these are the cheapest discs obtainable, they showed a remarkable tolerance to torture. This disc got one quick broadside hit of the 1,000 Gauss ceramic magnet. Only one file was damaged. To be fair, if the one damaged file had been the disc's directory, it would have disabled the entire file structure. This survived the 400 Gauss speaker, thus, but a second application, thus, killed it. This one survived the fridge magnet. Just to test the contact time theory, this one spent the night under the fridge magnet. No damage. This paperclip dispenser magnet measured in at around 300 Gauss. I couldn't hurt the disc with it at all. This was probably due to this tiny plastic ridge and the inverse square law. Now, I thought for sure that this was going to be trouble. Uh, especially since the magnetic field from the motor caused the computer monitor to bend. It was okay. I repeated the torture ten times. It was still readable. This one died in an eel attack. One brief contact with the eel skin wallet and poof. A year or so ago, there were a lot of reports that eel skin wallets were erasing the magnetic strips on credit cards. All of the media reported on it. Our National Broadcasting Service propagated this uh, information at least three times when I just happened to be listening. One of the reports was from a so-called informed listener who phoned in to share the fact that eel skin wallets were made from the skins of electric eels and that's why they damage magnetic stripes. This kind of totally unsupported reporting of science really ticks off Acme. So listen here, you reporters. In the first place, according to the dictionary, an electric eel isn't even an eel. It's a fish. In the second place, According to the manufacturers of these wallets, they don't use electric eel or fish skins. The clue to all of this eel bashing sits right out front. The closure. It is magnetic, and its field weighs in at a hefty 1,000 Gauss. One touch was enough to damage the test disc. Later, eel skin products dropped the magnetic catch in, in favor of a more credit card friendly latch. Now. Acme doesn't want to suggest that you get cavalier with your discs and tapes. Keeping them away from magnets of all kinds is a good idea. Just don't be too quick to repeat stories that you hear about someone whose entire video collection was ruined by the airport radar one mile away. If powerful magnets could project as far as most people will tell you, the Boy Scouts would all be lost in the woods. And if an eel wants to borrow your credit card, you have nothing to worry about.